The best time to write. The best time to write. The best time to write. Is now. Is now. Now. The best place to write. The best place to write. The best place to write is here. Is here. Is here. The best person to write. The best person to write. The best person to write. Is you. Is you. Is you. The best time to write is now. The best place to write is here. The best person to write is you. Picture a poetry slam mixed with a rap battle, mixed with a comedy slash storytelling session, mixed with a UFC fight, mixed with a WWE show, and you'll get the idea. Call it ultimate writing or mixed literary arts. You are taking two competitors in a three round battle of wits and words with flavor and a little bit of trash talk scattered around them. A four minute round, which is two minutes per fighter. is gonna be a six minute round that is three minutes per fighter. And eight, the eight minute round is four minutes per fighter. Fighters can present as many pieces as they want during their round. For example, if you wanted to squeeze 80 haiku into two minutes, you could totally do that. Um, there actually is no grace period for the time, so when you're done, you're just done. All scores given are legitimate and will determine future storylines. Each competitor portrays a character that is whatever they want to be. The competitors can be hero, villain, anti-hero, wild card, or brave. Fighters can bring any style of words they want to the fight. They can bring poetry, rap, comedy, storytelling, or a mix of any of these and beyond. It's a, it's a 10 point system, so if the winner of the round gets 10 points, the loser has to get 9 points or less. So, I should introduce our judges this evening. We have Tori. Give it up for Tori. Woo! And give it up for Molly. Woo! We appreciate that you've decided to get your dudgy faces on and and do this thing with us this corner way in on the purpose of purpose on the meaning of meaning author of we are made of found objects and writing night's own break law to break law the procrastinator in chief the buddha of bullshit your loudmouth liberal friend on facebook please love him jm Midnight, 
Race the light rising over the hill. Harness as much intention as my dopamine-deprived mind can muster towards manifesting something. Something like a sonnet or a new soup recipe pieced together from whatever resisted molding in my fridge. <laughs> I live in fear of not living enough. Grasp at lifestyles and straws and some coveted feeling of fulfillment I'm half convinced is only a fantasy. But I have to keep tailoring myself into something because thoughts left untrimmed grow thorns. So I list off nutrition facts, the life preferences of differing houseplants, the metaphysical traits of crystals, names of authors I may or may not have read, a litany invoked before bed each night in the hope of rising again tomorrow, feeling better and more and more and more and more. Oh, poor Atlas. Our love was a beast of burden on your shoulders, so I've heard. Man who thinks himself a mystic chose the wrong myth. No, Atlas, there was only Echo, crying your name over and over until she faded. A note can only sound so long when strings are no longer plucked. Man who thinks himself a musician didn't understand why the song ended, was surprised to hear it was written as a duet. What is it to walk out of a haunted house? What is it to walk out of a fog towards something solid? Who wouldn't need a string to guide them out of a labyrinth if they'd been led to the middle and left? You see Time. it here. <laughs> Aging Millennial Blues. My feet ache, my back aches, my heart aches from this overtime. Fifty hours this week still won't make ends meet, let alone put a dent in my debt. But the boomers I work with won't let me forget that my generation got participation trophies. Oh, please, spare me. I can't even with you, so I won't. I'm entitled to say, you get to retire, I don't. I've been 34 years in these bones, and it's going to take 79 more to pay off my student loans. But I'm still beating my feet against the concrete floor, still breaking myself and asking for more, still scraping by with the help of a roommate, my parents, or a side hustle or four. I'm getting too old for all this running around. I can't play, shit's different now. I don't even know the game anymore. I mean, people selling shit on Facebook now. What happened to eBay? <laughs> or word of mouth? The heck is a Snapchat? The fuck is a cash app? I can't keep up, I've been out. And phones are all touch screens now, can't even fit them in my pocket. What is this? Man, I missed my sliding keyboard. Oh Woo! <laughs>
How it constantly seems to be on the verge of falling apart, but somehow manages to hold itself together. You see, I am all American. About 30 seconds. 30 seconds, woo! All right. I have everything off. The best part of that was Jamie's look on her face with the... Right. <laughs> so like, you just got tired of you. Oh, oh my god. god. Oh, damn. Blood. Oh, yeah, right. Oh my god. Damn. Well, god. give it up again for J.M. Romick. Hi. September. You're still dripping from my hair. Me, a swimsuit laid over the edge of the tub to dry out. I haven't shook the dampness yet. It has only spread to my edges. At night, I wake up from dreaming of seeing you and telling you that I still dream of seeing you and telling you, and I wake up wondering if I said it out loud. If from states away, you could hear me in your head, I tilt back onto the pillow to drain the water from my ears. In the morning, I ask the curtains, I ask the plants on my windowsill for advice. Whether they heard my head ringing like a phone in the night, whether you left a message. They remind me that you still have my number if you want it. That you already apologized. That all the steps have already been taken and this last one is supposed to be called conclusion. I wring my hands and it leaves a puddle on my kitchen floor. Talking about you is easier now that you're gone. But now that you're gone, there's no one to talk to about you. I stop remembering your name so much as a sound and more as the feeling of chlorine in my eyes, the feeling of pressure on my ears. I ask the plates in my cupboard, I ask the spoons in my drawer whether you existed. They remind me of the steam that rose from my hair when I burned all your pictures. I find one that I missed tucked into a book under my bed. We never looked good in pictures, could never coordinate our smiles. I take a lighter to us over the sink and then lay myself out in the sun to dry a little faster. This one's for JM. Small. <laughs> <laughs> you have become the sick, soft feeling of gums left bare of pulled teeth, the slow mineral leaching of a deficiency, every regrettable metaphor stuck into a stanza like a kick-me sign on a middle schooler's back. But you are not fatal. You are not even stable enough to justify a sick day. You have deteriorated to the thinness of newsprint, ink smearing when I bother to thumb through you. You're a rock not big enough to form a bruise, just taking up space in my shoe, soon to be shaken out and kicked across the concrete. You have become nothing that cannot be forgotten or missed entirely. Tired and stereotypical and small. <laughs> Did you write that last piece just for this? A lady never tells. <laughs> <laughs>
Not a flash like you are, but who else would follow in your wake to voice the thoughts you never thought through before you ran too fast and hit the ground? I'd love to strike the lines and turn the power out with you. Town-wide blackout, riot. But one of us has got to survive. And I am less suspicious to them anyway. You smack your pack of marlboros against the table. I count every piercing in your face and sigh. I've become the girl who orders decaf. Washer dryer hookups. My used underwear and towels swirl shamelessly behind glass for the world to see, sudsy, come to a slow grinding halt, smell like the same detergent your mother always used. While they dry, recall a date in the laundromat, dating back to when what I wore wasn't governed by what was still clean, by whether I had free time on a weekend back when people were still worth impressing and I kept up with their pace. Count the quarters, as if we would ever not have enough. Divided between us and our little plastic cups, You'll remember it as novelty, not necessity, when we played at the aesthetic of a lifestyle that would eventually become all I could afford around each month's rent. Back when it felt like an expansion of self to take in the piles of other people's pants, the fish swimming across the 20-year-old wallpaper border and adventure. You were so bent on wanting to feel poor or important, whatever you thought would give your thoughts weight and movement and make your music matter, on appearing unattached to the same material things that made this experience so unique, so singular. How sufficient for a man whose mother still washes his socks for him. How other. <laughs> Recall the luxury of extra coins for pop and chips from a vending machine that actually worked. One book each. A whole beautiful, unbothered day ahead of us and vibration. The washing, drying rhythm, constant and gentle. A steady train taking us somewhere we still thought we wanted to go. All right, time is a funny thing. The days drag on and the weeks fly by in a blur. The years come faster and faster as yesterdays begin to compress into decades of blurred uh, blurred and fragmented memories, and even these eventually become debris in the wake of time's relentless march forward. And I wonder what the Earth like, looks like from the point of view of a comet sprinting toward it, just two celestial bodies fated for collision in 20 billion tomorrows. I think about humanity in those early days, and about how suddenly we went from hunting wild beasts with sticks and stones to hunting pizza with mobile phones, from gathering in caves and makeshift uh, huts, to, uh, to watch fire flicker and make children, to gathering on couches in living rooms to binge watch Netflix and make children. <laughs> I look up at the sky, at all of the stars, and think, how many of those died long ago, and how long will it take for us to get the memo? And despite all of this deep time thinking, I fail to stop myself from looking down. You see, nothing has changed. Not a minute slips by as I sit here and fidget, just awaiting your reply. Everything that's demonstrated. The newly empty hoarder's house feels lonely. There are clean squares of carpet marking where the boxes were obsessively stacked in neat high towers. And the backyard is full of rain wooing childhood keepsakes, blurry photographs of ghosts, and too many boxes of ink bleeding love letters never sent. The highways are littered with stories of what could have been, shattered on the cruel asphalt of this stubborn perpetual now. We are all the victims of nostalgia, cobbling together a makeshift self from what remains of who we were yesterday, but memory is often misremembered, and history is a book with too many missing chapters and unreliable narrators. Despite our best efforts, we are not at all good at keeping things. The newly emptied hoarder's house feels hopeful. See, the foyer uh, is, no, is no longer unusable. You can breathe and not gag on a thick atmosphere of ammonia. The front yard has freshly cut grass for the first time in forever. We can see where a garden can grow. There's a swing set out there with chains that are rusted from years of neglect, uh, but we know it's not unfixable. Nothing is unfixable. We are all survivors of the past, given a choice every day about what to keep and what to throw away. And who we are, uh, and who we are today, and what relationship we have with the things left on the endless road behind us. Tomorrow, it's a terrifyingly, terrifyingly white page, a terrifyingly perfect white page, screaming at us, daring us to make some kind of mark upon it. 
Take up the challenge. Make new. But remember, as you do, that we are not at all good at keeping things. Because things aren't meant to be kept. Send your love letters while there is still love in them. You see, the, new, the newlyweds' first home feels like possibility. Thanks. So, audience, how did you feel about the match? Yeah! Woo all right. All right. So even though we are, you know, this is scored by judges, I still want to find a good sense of where the audience is. So I will ask you to clap and cheer for the person that you personally would prefer with. So if you prefer that Jamie love under be the winner, like clap and cheer now. So we have our scores for the split decision of 30, 26, 29, 28, and 28, 29. The winner of our first ever sword fight, Jamie Lobacher. Not, not confirmed yet. Not Still waiting. That, yet. Uh, that, that's, that's why. That's why it's an open. That's why it's an that's open challenge. That's unfortunate because you see, I mean, I, I know that uh, last month uh, Yoli was running her mouth a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't get a lot of it. Didn't end up getting on camera, but all of us were a little tongue tied that night. That happens. Mm -hmm. um, I would be very happy to give JM another chance to redeem himself if that is uh, what he'd be interested in. I am also interested in facing off with the winner here. I uh, I came I came here to play, and I didn't come here to play with Scrubs. Ooh. Oh shit! So, uh, uh, I want the best. I want the best. And uh, you only if you can hear me at home. I, I mean you too, lady. <laughs> so. All right. So you heard it here. There's an open call out to challenge Daria in uh, August. So that might be one of us. Writing night. Writing night. Writing night.